2 Peter, chapter number 2. We'll begin reading in verse number 17. The Bible says, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. When they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, these are again entangled therein, and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for an opportunity to be in your house tonight. Lord, I pray that uh, you'd hide me behind the cross, Lord, and you'd take the efforts of this unworthy servant, Lord, and I pray that uh, you'd use your word to help your people tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, all the way back in verse number 9, the Apostle Peter starts off describing individuals that are among the redeemed, but they're not living like it. And as a result of those people, we find the caution in verse number 17 that these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Well, how do we identify some of these individuals? Well, first, verse number 18, he says, They speak great swelling words of vanity. Anybody that's saved, and you know, man look at on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. But anybody that claims to be saved, but all that they talk about is either themselves, or they're really good at talking about nothing, which is what vanity means, emptiness. Chances are, they've got something wrong going on down in their heart. Right Then it goes on to say, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. They're always hungry, never satisfied. And they seek to fill themselves with the desires of the flesh, not with the desires of the Spirit. Then, it goes on to say in verse number 19, it says, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. Everybody's claiming that they've found a new way, but I've only found one way that'll lead to freedom, that the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. But he says, whatever they've come under, later in verse number 19, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. Whatever overcame you, not talking about things that can overcome your salvation, things that are overcome your desires, things that will overcome your love, things that will overcome your devotion to the things of God. If you're overcome by something, then that controls you. Some people are overcome by fear. Some people are overcome by loneliness or separation. Some people are overcome by what other people think about them. But as a result of it all, whatever overcomes you, that's what you become a part of. You're in bondage. Until the Lord breaks that bondage, you'll never return to true liberty. But they promise freedom, but really they're just servants of whatever's put them back into bondage. Then verse number 20 says, For if they after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. What an indictment. It says that they overcame. I remind you, we're more than conquerors through Christ. Christ overcame their sin. He broke their chains of bondage, but yet they once again are entangled therein. The very thing that they realized they needed to be set free from, now they think that that's what they need. Then verse number 21, very serious statement. Peter says that, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. He's saying it would have been better for them to be ignorant of what God expects out of His children than to know what God expects and then turn away from it. 
He's not saying it would have been better for them if they never got saved. What he's saying is, some people, they may find a track one day and get saved. They may never know that it's God's will for them to be a part of a church. God forbid that that would happen, especially in America. Right? But certainly, places like you know, China, North Korea, Vietnam, other places where they have laws on what religions you can and can't practice, some people may not have all of the privileges that are afforded to us. But those that have been rooted in truth, they know the difference between what a child of God looks like and what a child of God doesn't look like. It'd be better for that individual to have not known anything about God than to know what to do and then do the exact opposite. In fact, he says, it happened to them just like the true proverb in verse number 22. He says, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the sow returns to the mire after she's been clean. He's saying, dogs, you can try and figure a dog out. I've learned every dog's a little weird. Right, there's just something weird about why a dog would throw up and then want to be anywhere around it. I don't know about you, don't know about you guys, right? One of the things I hate most in the world, throwing up. Right? I would be miserable through a whole lot of running at football practice and a whole lot of football practice thereafter trying my hardest not to throw up. Granted, if I probably would have, I would have felt a whole lot better for the rest of the day. But no, I hate it so much, I'm not going to do it. But yet, spiritually, we should hate the world, detest it, just as much as we should hate anything else. Right? That's what we used to be. That's what kept us in bondage. That's what kept us in sin. But yet, some people look at something that we ought to revile. Some people desire it. You can clean some people up. And, you know, a sow, you can put lipstick on a pig, but the pig's still going to ruin the lipstick in the mud. You can do whatever you want to. Pig's going back to the mud. But the thing that baffles it is that's the nature of a dog. That's the nature of a sow. If you're in Christ, He made you a new creature. You're not the old creature. You're rejecting everything that God put in you to return to what you used to be. That's why I use that word entangled in verse number 20. They are again entangled therein. And as I was reading this, verse number 17, they're wells without water. But wells in the Bible are very important. They didn't live in Florence, Kentucky, where before, you know, all the boats used to go down the Ohio River, right? It wasn't all muddy from all the silt being turned up all the time. You know, we got rivers all over the place around here. We got creeks, right? In fact, road down yonder is called Gunpowder Creek because that's a creek that runs right by it. Right? We live in a land that even if we didn't have city and county water, water is available. Not, not so in the lands of the Bible. Right? In fact, you could only go so far as how much water you could carry. They didn't plan routes out based on what was the shortest direction between A and B. If you were traveling, you knew how much water you had, and you knew where the wells were. You had to carry enough water to get you to the next well. Carry enough water to get to the next well. If they didn't have wells, they didn't go anywhere. Towns didn't sprout up next to the prettiest areas. They sprouted up to where they could find water. Not salt water. Fresh water. I mean, there are a whole bunch of places. I mean, you could try and build a city on the side of the Dead Sea, but that's, that's really salty water. Saltiest inland water that, you know, known to man. That water's not going to do you any good. Vice versa. You can try and pave a new way, but if there's no water on the way, there's no well for you to stop and be refreshed at, you're not going very far. Eventually, you're going to get that heat stroke, start seeing them mirages, think you found a coconut tree, and there's no coconut tree over there. It's just more sand. So spiritually, the implication, whenever Jesus talks about wells, they're in the Old Testament, the wells were a picture of God's provision. I have no idea where to find water, especially if it's underground. 
There's a whole bunch of swindlers throughout history that said that if you took two little uh, dousing rods, isn't that what they were called? You could find, if they crossed, you could find where the water was. Them jokers were wrong a whole lot more than they were right. The only way to really find a well is you go to a place and you start digging holes. Then when water's at one of them, you build a bigger hole. Then you fortify it so it doesn't fall in on itself. So every time through the Old Testament where it makes mention that they found a well, it was a picture of God's provision. Now, why'd they dig there? Because God told them to. Why'd they find water? Because God wanted them to. God made a well come out of a rock for Moses and the Israelites. Right? He's not limited based on where the water He can get the water to you as long as you follow after Him. So the well's always very important. Well, here, talking about people that are saved, he says these people are wells without water. That brought back what Jesus said about the Pharisees to my mind. He called the Pharisees cisterns that could hold no water. Now, there's a difference between a well and a cistern. What's a cistern? Well, that's something that you build to hold water. It doesn't have its own source of water. You've got to put water into the cistern. A well has a source. Never runs out. If your well dries up, you've got to find a new one real quick. But if God gave you the well, it's not going to dry up. So between the cistern and the well, find a comparison. Now, the Pharisees, they still under the law. They were still abiding to what God had given in the Old Testament. And Jesus called them cisterns. Why? Because they had no source of water. They were just relying on the grace and the mercy of God to pour water out. And they'd do their best to hold on to it. Right? Throughout the whole Old Testament, we find that God would send a rainstorm here, or He'd cause a flood here. What was that? That was to fill up cisterns to keep people looking towards the fact that one day God was going to send a lamb. One day, the temporary water would be replaced with everlasting water. But see, the Pharisees were cisterns that could hold no water. Why? Because everything on the outside looked like it was meant to glorify God, but yet they taught the commandments of man as commandments of God. They were all about edifying self. And because it was all about them, right? I'll draw your attention back to verse number 18. They speak with great swelling words of vanity. They allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. It was all about them and how much they could get. That's why they couldn't hold any water. Because God would pour out the blessings and they weren't looking for what God wanted. They were looking for what they wanted. They could hold no water. Everything that God had given to give them satisfaction, to hold them over until Christ came. They couldn't hold it. Had no interest in it. But see, this is different. Because they're not cisterns. He says they're wells with no water. Well, in order to have a well, at one point, you had to have water. Otherwise, it's just a hole. But we know that they know of the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus say? If any man drink of the water that I give him, it'll be a well springing up within him unto everlasting life. That means Jesus said, you drink of the water that I've got, I'll put a well in you. Well, their well's dry. What happened? God didn't turn the spigot off. They turned the spigot off. Out through how they were living. So what the Lord's help tonight, we're going to preach on, how's your water? How's your water? We're going to find out a little bit more about these people that had the dry wells. We've already mentioned the Pharisees, how they didn't have wells. They were just living from God's grace, God's mercy, God's instructions to get them to where they could have the well. Right? But wells, very important. I mean, I will remind you that when Isaac, right, Abraham's already gone off the scene. Isaac needs a source of water. We talked about this in Sunday school a little while ago. Where did he go to? A place where he knew that there was water. He redigged the wells of Abraham, his father. Why? Because he knew that that well had water in the bottom. Right? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? The source that he gives us 
always has water what do we have to do we got to keep going back to the well but then Christ said that it was better for Christ to go away he was everlasting life but he says it was better for him to go to heaven so that the comforter could come who do you think that well inside of us really is it's the Holy Ghost so for somebody to be a well with no water means that they've grieved the Holy Ghost in their life to the point that they have no interest in hearing, no desire, and they will not hear the voice of God in their life. That's dangerous. Right? So the first group of people, we got the people that block their wells. How's your water? Well, theirs is non-existent. Now, go back with me, if you will, to verse number 9 in chapter number 2. It says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? We just heard singing about how great God is, about how He provides for us. Right? Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Right? Amen. But the verse continues. He says, And the Lord knoweth how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. God knows how to provide for the godly, but He also knows how to take care of the unjust. Because our God is holy which by definition means that he knows what is holy and he, if he doesn't know it, it's unholy. God doesn't know sin. He's never partaken in it. But he knows what's holy and what's not. And he also knows that he set forth the commandment, Be ye holy for I am holy. He knows that he sent men of God throughout the ages to proclaim this is the way that you ought to be. Right? And back in verse number 21, remember, it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness we know what righteousness is it's Christ that's the goal right? but verse number 10 talking about those people again that have stopped up their own will they says that they walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government presumptuous are they self willed people that stop up their wells it's all about them self-willed well what's presumptuous mean well to break it down real easy means that one they assume a lot but two it also means that they're daring right you ever heard anybody preach on you better be careful what you, you just might be daring God to deal with it that's a presumptuous man right the very fact that someone is unobedient to God is daring God to chastise them we're not talking about lost folk. We're talking about saved folk. But yet some are so daring, but Phil, that instead of abiding to what God says we ought to look like, which is His Son, they dare to either add to or take away or pervert the Word of God in their hearts to where they think that they know what they ought to be. You say, well, that doesn't happen. It happens all the time. There's not a famine for the preaching of the Word. There's a famine for the hearing of the Word. We hear, but it doesn't get into our hearts. That's why in that phrase, over in verse number 21, known the way of righteousness, to know something, it has to become a part of you. Didn't say that they had heard about the way of righteousness. They knew it. It became a part of them. If you know something, you heard it, but then you stored it somewhere in you. Why do you think David wrote in the Psalms, I word have I hid in my heart? that I might not sin against thee. He made it a part of him. He knew it. But they knew it, and yet they dare to assume that they know better than God. It says that they walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Right? If you desire to live a Christian life, good. But all the desire isn't going to mean that we're going to be perfect. Some of us walk after the flesh in accident, in failure, in stumble. But they walk after the flesh, lusting after it. That's what they desire. Right? It's one thing for somebody that wants to live righteous to know that they've messed up and get it made right. They weren't walking after the flesh. The flesh just took a step. Then they had to rebuke the flesh, ask the Lord to forgive them, and then nail that flesh back to their cross, take up their cross, and follow after Jesus. Like we, wherever He leads, that's where we're going. Like we sung about in the uh, congregational. 
But some people, they have no interest in taking up their cross. They have no interest in becoming the new creature. Those are the people that stop up their own wells. Why would God give water to something that opposes Him? Their lifestyle spits in mockery at what Christ did for them. That's why they have no water. But let's continue. Verse number 13. It says that they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Sound familiar? Anybody remember the year 2020? A whole lots of riots happening, but they didn't happen at night. Some people used to, knew, used to know if you're going to riot, you riot at nighttime. Right? You've got the cover of... They're so bold that they want to riot against the things of God daily, openly, to all that will see. And then they wonder why their well is dry. But then, later on in that verse, verse number 13, it says, Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Again, they're apart, but they've separated themselves to uncleanness, not to righteousness. We're supposed to be separated unto God. They've separated themselves away from the things of God. That's why Peter's writing to warn them. He's saying, these people are among you, but don't be partakers with them. He says, live is the example of what they ought not be. God will take care of them. God knows how to keep you out of temptation, but He also knows how to handle His own children that aren't living justly. But He says, be wary, be cautious. Because they claim that they found a well that satisfies, but there's nothing in the bottom of that well. He's saying they're wells without water. There's spots and blemishes. Well, what kind of church is Jesus coming back for? One without spot and one without blemish. Well, what does that tell you? Well, I'm no prophet. And I certainly don't understand all the prophecy because some things we won't know until we get to heaven. But I do know that if Jesus is coming back for a church without spot and without blemish, that means God's going to deal with them before Jesus comes back. Some will be turned over to the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved. Some will have to be broken so that they return to the way called straight. Some may put themselves in an early grave. But when Jesus comes back, He's getting a church without spot and without blemish. And certainly, after we all get to heaven, we get that glorified body like His, we'll be without spot and without blemish. But imagine the heartbreak and the judgment and the sheer realization of how much you've let God down when you have to stand before Jesus Himself, give an account of the deeds done in your body after you've been saved. That's why Peter says it had been better for him to not know the way of righteousness than to know it and then forsake it. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. But it's also fearful to stand before that holy God and have to explain why you did what you did when you knew what the right way was. There's spots and blemishes, and He's going to purge them. They're on their way to heaven, but God's not happy with them. No water. Verse number 14, it goes on to say, having eyes full of adultery. Right, well, let's play ignorant here for a second well I thought adultery was an act that was sinful it is but Jesus said if you look upon a woman and desire her in your heart you've committed adultery already eyes full of things a lust or a desire to break covenants that they've made but when you got saved you said Lord not me I need Christ you've broken that in your life if you return to the world you've broken the promise or any promises that you made to God, you've broken what God had put back together, which was fellowship with God. But when you desire, desire the things in the world, we lust after the world, we lust after what we used to be, we may not do it, but they've got eyes full of adultery. They want to return back to what they used to be. Desiring it in your heart's only one step away from stepping out and doing it. The sin is not in actually doing it. It's the fact that you want to do it. Right? Thankfully, it's not a sin to have a thought, but to let that thought dwell, to let that thought take root in our heart. 
Right? If a man lusteth, he didn't say that that was the sin. Although it is a sin to lust after the... But if a man lusteth after a woman and in his heart desire... I mean, it took root. It's changed in the way that you act and the way that you live because you want something. He's guilty of adultery already. Well, how many things do we lust after that we know would be fornication against God and the standard of righteousness... Those people that are guilty of that. It's very easy to be guilty of that. But those that are guilty of that, they've stopped up the wells. They've got no water. Then, later on in verse number 14, beguiling unstable souls. Somebody that's miserable spiritually wants to make other people miserable spiritually so they've got company. And does it say that they go after you know, in New Testament terminology, that they went after the bishops or the pastors of the churches? No. Does it say it went after the rooted saints of God? No. They went after the unstable. Those that didn't know better, those that weren't discipled properly, those that didn't receive instruction with gladness, instead, they went, well, that's just Brother Duck. That's just his opinion. Well, that's just what Brother Jordan teaches in Sunday school. That's not really true. That's what Brother Josh preaches. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the way that I believe it. That person's very close to being beguiled by somebody that's already got a well that no water. They want you to have no water. Misery loves company. But again, verse number 19 talked about that they've been brought under bondage by whatever's overcome them. Meaning, really, they're not the one that desires to destroy you. It's the ruler of this world. The powers and you know, principalities and darkness and spiritual wickedness and high places, it overcame them. It desires to overcome you too. Because your very life as a Christian is saying, there's water, but not in this world. It's in Christ. So it desires to stop up your well. Desires to have people look into your well and say, well, there's nothing at the bottom of this well. Whatever they claim to have, it's not going to help me. Right? Well, goes on to say in verse number 14, and heart they have exercised with covetous, or covetous practices, cursed children. Their hearts are not exercised unto faith. Their hearts are not exercised unto belief, or to obedience, or to sanctification, or righteousness. Their hearts are exercised in coveting things of the world, things that God's given to other people, coveting what they don't have and using it as an excuse to fall out with God. Why? Because it's all about them. They think that they deserve more. It's all based around self and vanity. And what does it leave them? The definition of vanity, empty. Their well has no water. But it doesn't call them cursed bastards. Right? If you're not of the Lord, you're a bastard, not a son. It doesn't call them bastards. What's it call them? Children. They know God. They're one of His, but they're cursed. Not by sin. Not by the world. They're cursed by disobedience. By rebellion. And we know that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Because you've lifted yourself up as the God in your life instead of submitting unto God. We ask, why are their wells stopped up? This is why their wells are stopped up. They've turned their back on God. But then, verse number 15, the beginning part says, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray. To forsake something, at one point you had to know it. You had to be a part of it. It had to be a part of you in order for you to turn your back on it. These aren't people that made a false profession and claim to be saved but they never were these aren't people that you know was misled and made twofold the child of hell in a false religion it's isn't talking about people that claim to know these are people that know God and they forsook it we say brother Jordan why are you preaching so hard because I feel sorry for these people they're miserable they have no water just because they should have known doesn't mean we can look down our noses at them. 
we should desire to restore such one in a spirit of meekness, lest we likewise be tempted. I don't know what they were tempted with. All I know is that when I'm tempted, verse number 9, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. And because He's done it for me, I know He can do it for them. I know He can deliver them. I know He can break those chains. But the problem is, you gotta, how do you get somebody like that to want to desire the water that was in the well originally? If we could figure that out, we'd have a great church. Huge, massive, tens of thousands. But it's not up to what we can do. That's between them and God. But we can... I mean... Peter wrote them the letter and said, Mark them. Take note of them. Don't become partakers with them. Right? Who are we to kick anybody out of the house of God? Hopefully God will get a hold of their hearts. But just because they're among you doesn't mean that they're with you. Just because they come every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, doesn't mean that they're hooked up to the same yoke that you are. They may have been bought, but they haven't been submitted in their life unto God why are we supposed to mark them because God doesn't like rebellion if everyone rebelled who would there be to bring some back into the fold but Elijah thought he was yeah he thought he was the only one left God said I've got thousands that haven't bowed a knee unto Baal that he says you're not the only one in the fight go tell those that have rebelled that have turned their back on me that have gone the way of Balaam as verse number 15 says exhorted themselves wiser than God who's going to be there to help them back to the things of God if they all rebelled right? but make no mistake compassion and acceptance are two different things you can have compassion on those that are sinful because you know where they work because you used to be there you can have compassion on those that are backslid on God that are cold on God that have rebelled against God in their life but that doesn't mean you have to accept where they are. You accept them, you don't accept the sin. Why? Because if you have compassion, we may be able to make a difference. But too often, compassion turns into affection, and we stop looking at what the person does. All we see is somebody that we like. Somebody that we like to hang around with. That's why the... Apostle Peter warned, he says, some of them come in and eat among you. They're fellowshipping with, fellowshipping with you, but have no fellowship with what they're really fellowshipping with. He says, set up a line of demarcation. I'm not going to where you're going to go, because I love Jesus. But some people, they, they have stopped up with, how's their water? It's gone. They go out into the world, and they reach down into their well trying to get a drink, and what's their well made out of? Themselves. What's in the bottom of a well made of you? Dirt. Because that's what God made us out of. That I'm reminded of Esau. Esau took two wives. One of them, her name was Fragrance, and then her dad's name was Strong, so like a strong perfume. Esau didn't like the way that he smelled, so he tried to make himself smell better. He knew God wasn't happy with his life, so he tried to pull a cane and offer up a sacrifice of what he thought God would accept, and God wasn't pleased with it. But then the second wife that he had, her name was Praise, and her father's name was Well. Or in other words, Praise My Well. Esau sunk his own well and God had wanted God to put water in it, but God said, that's not the way we do it. You dig the well where I tell you to dig, and then you'll find water. But there's a lot of people out there that have no water in their well, and they're trying to make themselves smell as good as they can right it doesn't have to be somebody that's out there living with the world you can be empty and still dress yourself up real nice on the outside Jesus called the Pharisees whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones right? they are cunning because the world that they've gone to has made them cunning they're vicious because the world that they've gone to has made them vicious they have become in bondage of the thing that overcame them. There is danger in helping those people. They can have more of an impact on you than you're having on them. Because you can try all you want to, but it's going to take an act of God to change that person's heart. It's going to take God to do a work in their heart. 
Certainly we ought to go. Certainly we ought to seek to restore. But you also have to understand, if they've got no water, they're going to try and suck you dry of all the water you've got. Right, well, how's your water? Some people have borrowed water. Some people don't know how to put water in their well, Brother Donald. Jesus promised your well would be springing forth with water unto everlasting life. Well, why? Because the well is not contingent on me. It's contingent on Him. We've already said, the Holy Ghost, who do you think's putting the water there? There's nothing special in us. God sunk a water in a whole bunch of dirt and then caused a whole lot of water to come out. How'd that happen? I don't know, because I didn't have water in me in the first place. Right? If I did, my water would have run out a whole long time ago. But see, just because God promised that there'd be water springing up, that means there's too much water for you to contain. Right? You can't hold all the things God's putting in you. It's got to come out. But again, that doesn't mean that God promised wherever you go, there's going to be water. If you're right with God, there's going to be water. But if you're not right with God, there's not going to be water. Some people are expecting other people put water in their well. They're freeloaders. They don't know how to keep the water in their life. They don't know how to have a relationship with God such that God will satisfy them with water. They're looking for other people's wealth. They come to you and they're saying, I'm just having a bad day. Can you help me out? Well, if I can, yeah, but I know one that can take care of whatever it is. I know one that wherever you go, as long as you're right with Him, you're going to have more than enough water to keep you satisfied. You're not going to be thirsty. You're not going to be looking for something somewhere else because you've got all you need in Him. Some people expect other people to feed them spiritually. Some people expect other people to pray for them because they don't have confidence in their own prayer. Some people are so anemic spiritually that they just expect, well, we're supposed to bear one another's burdens. True. But it doesn't say that I'm supposed to be responsible for your spirituality. Something may be hard for you, and because of the love of God that God put in my heart, I should desire to help us. Why? Because I say us. I didn't say you. Because we're fitly framed together. There is no I in you. It is us, the church. If you're hurting, I'm hurting. That's why I desire to help you. But if all of your hope is in a person, you, you don't have any water. There's some people just come to church thinking that, well, I've come to get a little bit of water. Well, this is the only time you've got water. You're thirsty five days of the week. If all the water you've got is what you get when you come to church, while we're here, Brother Brian, show me in the Bible where we come to church and God said that it is His intent for us to come so that we can leave with stuff. No, we come to the house of God to offer up everything we got. We're supposed to come and pour out our praise unto God. We ought not come to church expecting anything. But because God is just the way that He is, I can't thank Him for all that because every time I come, just want to talk about how great He is. He inhabits the praise of His people. Next thing you know, His presence... If you're around the presence of God, you're going to walk out with something. Right now, notice, we're talking about water. I'm not talking about food. He just sang it. Man should not live on bread alone. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth. This is where your bread, this is where your meat's coming from. Right? Daily, you ought to be asking, Lord, feed me. But then, God also knew that some people, been saved a little bit longer than that, there's some people, pastors, no, a little bit more are led by God to teach us so that we grow together while also growing individually. We're not talking about food. We're talking about water. What is what water to keep you from getting thirsty? God will feed you every day, but God will also make sure that you're not thirsty. You can live longer without food than you can without water. Right? You need water. Every second, every day. They say you're supposed to drink an ounce of water for your body weight divided by two. Right? I don't have enough to carry around like eight gallons of water in me, so I don't know how much water they want me to drink. That doesn't make sense to me. But I do know that you better be filled up before you go into the world. Because the world's going to drain you. Right? Just like in Jesus' day, the world out there, it's dry. It's hot. It's a long trek from well to well because there's not a lot of God out there. 
Right? The world has tried to snuff God out. They've tried to pour dirt into all of his wells, like the herdsman of Gerar did with uh, Abraham's wells, and Isaac's had to redig re them. There's strife out there. There's conflict out there. It's tiring. You need more water than you can just get when you come to church. But there are some people, they don't know whether through, you know, apathy. They always thought they didn't need to know how. But Brother Doug always preaches real good. Well, by the grace of God, thankfully he has given us good pastor. But there's no message that can keep you satisfied from Sunday to Wednesday and then from Wednesday to Sunday. That the message is supposed to strengthen you, give you the meat to grow. You've got to get your own water. That's why Jesus promised to be the well inside of you. Some people don't know how to fellowship with God or how to, you know, have supplication with God. Some people don't know what it is to get into the Word of God. They know what it is to read it, but they don't know what it is when God just starts opening it up unto them. They don't know how deep their well can really go. And they don't know how well God can fill it. Some people rely on other people's daily devotions in order to give them what they need. Some people come to you, I've got this going on. What does the Bible say about this? You've been saved just as long as I have. How come you don't know? I'll tell them, but in the back of my head I'm thinking, shouldn't you know this? Somebody been around here as long as they... The things that people have questions, sometimes it just dumbfounds me. So I'm not a pastor. I've got too much judgment in me still. I've gotten to the point where I don't say it anymore. Right? He's working on me. But every now and then I still think it. Why is that a problem? Because some people just don't know how to get their own water. Their water's borrowed, which means that there's not a lot of it. Because I find that it gives me a lot of water, but usually I need all that water. Every now and then, he'll fill me with a little bit extra all the way up to the brim to help somebody along the way. But most of the time, when I give a drink to somebody, find in the Bible, it's not safe for people that I'm supposed to be giving water. I'm supposed to be giving water to those that don't know Christ so that they can taste and see that the Lord is good. I'm supposed to know how to get not just all the water I need, but all the water God wants me to give out. But imagine how much more water would be spread out there if God's people didn't have to give water to other children of God. How much more water there would be to pour out into the community if everybody knew how to possess his vessel in honor. Right? Under God. Lord, fill me up. Not hoping, but knowing that God will do it. Because He promised to. Why? So that, Lord, thank You for providing for me. But more importantly, thank You for letting me go give some of this to somebody else. Because the great thing is, if you know well what, where a well is, doesn't matter how many times you empty your bucket, you can always go back and get more. Doesn't matter how many people God sends you to in one day, you've got the well. You can get all the water that you need. Because it's not based on me. It's based on who gave me the well. Right, but then, there are also those that their water's polluted. I'll remind you that the Israelites did come to a creek named Mara. Why? Because it was bitter. It was salty. Some people have been dumping salt into their well. And every time they drink it, it makes it more bitter. Some people have a well that have been tainted by their tongue. We talked about that a few weeks ago in Sunday school. What James referred to your tongue as something full of venom. Some people have been pouring venom into their well trying to get other people to take a drink out of it. Get them infected. Right? They may not be desiring the life of the world, but they're not happy where they are and they want you to be unhappy. They want to pollute you. They've polluted themselves, and as a result, you know, the water may have been shut off, but they're holding on to just enough to where they can mix in whatever they've got and offer it to somebody hoping to turn them into what they are. But what's that person's problem? That person's problem is they got a, a heart problem, but a whole lot different than the first group. They're not desiring the things of the world. They may not be desiring something in themselves. Something's taking root in them. 
And it's changed them. These people return to what they used to be in our text. These are people, they've been turned into something different than that new creature. But it's not what they used to be either. Some might be wolves in sheep's clothing. Some of them might be people that are just backslid on God. They don't remember what it is to know how much God can take care of them. Some of them are callous. Some of them are apathetic. Some of them just tired. The Bible does say not grow weary in well-doing, but some people get weary. Some people have just been hurt. Some people have been hurt, but they've never been healed from it. Right? And sadly, particularly the Baptists, have a reputation that what are we? Judgmental. We look down on people. Right? If you don't meet this certain set of criteria, you can't be a part of us. You know why that reputation happened? Because some people, they just had their water changed. And God's not going to mix unclean with clean. He's not going to pump more water in until we get that water out. So how do we do that? We ask Him to remove it. Because I don't trust me to get all of me out of myself. But some people, their water, it's had something added to it. And as a result, it has an impact on other people. Right, if we can convince people that, well, no, you don't have to worry about living. If you can just do these things, God will be all right with it. I find that those that add to or take away from the Word have very serious consequences at the end of the book of Revelation. I find that if someone offend a little child, it'd be better for them to be thrown into a lake with a big old stone hooked around their neck. I find that those that hurt those that are following after God, God deals with them very, very, you know, seriously. It's not a little smack on the wrist. Why is that? Because if my well's polluted and I get somebody else to drink, I've polluted them. Little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. And what we don't realize is even if nobody's drinking from my well, if it's polluted, it's still a part of us. One bad well does affect everybody else. I'm reminded of that story Dad told after they got back from St. Lucia the first time. How they went to them sulfur springs, and the sulfur springs smelled like sulfur and brimstone. They say it smells like rotten eggs. Not good. If something's not right with your water, people can smell it. It's evident. If something in your water... It and right, I know mine's not supposed to have an odor. It's clean. Right? What's it taste like? It tastes like water. It's clean. It doesn't taste like anything else. But I mean, you don't even have to taste it to know that somebody else's well's not right. Right? Whatever the case is, those that have bad water, until they realize that they need new water, the same new water that he put in us when he saved us. They're going to stay in the same situation. But just because somebody else maybe, well, I haven't done anything to anybody else. You don't have to. Some people, just the smell. Right? I mean, you guys know about the, the radon testers in your houses? Right? That's why they say in spring cleaning every year, you're supposed to open the windows and let the air get through the whole house. Because radon's heavier than most other air. Usually ends up in your basement. And it's odorless. Doesn't have a taste doesn't have a smell but if you don't air it out you can walk downstairs one day get knocked out and then you die because all you're breathing is radon not getting any oxygen that's why they have the radon testers that's why they have carbon monoxide testers and everything else it's to let you know when something that you can't see and you can't smell can hurt you but sometimes people's water may not taste it may never drink it but just the odor alone can cause people harm. Right? Try sticking your mouth onto a gas engine, like whatever pipe comes out of it. Try breathing that. Not going to work. Well, I didn't drink the gasoline. No, but you huff the fumes. Well, I'm not doing anybody else any harm. You don't know that. 
It's only by the grace of God that we don't hurt people unintentionally all the time. But willfully knowing there's something wrong with my water and still letting it fester, that only causes more problems for other people. Right, well, what is the right kind of water? How do we get it? And then we'll close. Right water, pure, undefiled. Right, just like we're instructed that our religion is supposed to be pure and undefiled. Where does that come from? It comes from a lack of self. It comes from no expectation. Lord, I am yours. You can do with me however you please. Not saying every day is going to be sunshine and rainbows, but in the midst of everything, your well is undefiled. What is outside does not take root inside. Well, how do we do that? Well, daily, early in the morning will I seek thee. Daily He bestows benefits on us. We can't even comprehend how good God is to us every day. But every day, the Bible says that He remakes the promises that He's made to us through the Bible. Every day He remakes them to you. The only thing that keeps us from having the well that we ought to have is us. God's removed every boundary, every obstacle, everything that used to be a part of us before we got saved. He removed it all, made us into a new creature so that we could receive what God wants us to receive. Well, how do you get obedience, submission, humility? Right? Getting into the Word of God and saying, Lord, I know that you may have taught me this before and I'm sorry that I forgot it. But Lord, I need something today and I know that you've got it for me. Lord, I don't deserve to know about your goodness. I don't deserve to know about the way of righteousness because of what I used to be. But Lord, with your help, I can be what you want me to be. That pure water, it's unassuming. You know what you were when you came to God and asked to be His? You didn't think anything of yourself. Right? You might have been lower than a snake's belly. But in that state, you understood what you needed. Right? I mean, wasn't that the rebuke that John wrote to the church at Laodicea that they increased with goods and thought that they had need of nothing? It's real easy to think that God's given you everything that you'll ever need. And when you get to that point, it might be about the time that the water gets shut off. Not because God shut it off, but because you said, I don't need any more. Stop drinking water right now. I can tell you, I'm craving this right here, right now. Right, But stop drinking water right now and see how long you'll make it. You'll be good for a little bit. But see, just because you realize you're thirsty, doesn't mean that the water is going to come back on. You've got to get back to where the water comes from. Every well has a source. And as long as that source is okay, the well's okay. I promise you, everything's okay in heaven. Jesus hasn't changed. We've got to get back to Him. But it's not just about coming. It's about coming to God the way that God deserves to be come to. Right? We ought, if we really understood how great God is... None of us would walk into the house of God. We'd crawl into the house of God. And there'd never be anybody to do any singing because we'd be on the altar praising God for how good He's been to us. But it's so easy to be filled with self and think, well, Lord, thanks for blessing me. That was a result of me being obedient to you. No, that was a result of God being gracious and merciful. You didn't deserve it even on your best day. Somewhere along the way, we think that we've earned cookie points with or brownie points with God. He gives us a gold star on the attendance calendar. The only reason He does anything is because He doesn't see us. He sees us robed in the righteousness of His Son. Closest that we can ever get this side of heaven to being what God wants us to be is to get as close to Jesus as we can be. And so long as nothing comes between us and Him, there'll be water in the well. But Peter says there's some... They got bad water. 
They got borrowed water. Some got no water. They've got a well, which means that Jesus put the well in them. But they've let something happen to them to where the well doesn't have the right water anymore. So Sister Renee's coming. Brother Ray gets a song invitation. Let's pray. Just ask you tonight, how's your water? If you can tell that something's going bad in the water, you can fix it a whole lot sooner than letting it get to the point where everybody knows there's a problem. Right? Unless we ask the Lord to show us our hearts, how can we truly know what we have in our hearts? Right, but let's pray as they're coming and getting a song and as Brother Josh is coming. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to preach. Lord, I pray that you take the effort to someone just trying to do their best. Lord, I pray that you'd been glorified by it. Lord, I pray that uh, you'd been exalted by it. Lord, I pray that uh, you'd edify, encourage, and Lord, strengthen your people by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.